it is actually Friday for me uh, this time. I didn't get around to doing this yesterday. I, I was just too tired after um, meeting with four different classes and, and talking all day. Um, I finished my I finished my Netflix show yesterday. I was watching the show Sense8 and then I finished it um, yesterday. I was watching it for like four straight hours, I think. But um, yeah, I'm not very good with like um, like when the plot of something thickens and then I'm kind of like, oh, I want to know what happens next. So I'm like really bad with that because then I just get in a deep hole of like watching the next episode, and the next episode until. Um, you know, I haven't like, you know, it's time for me to go to bed and I'm like still watching the next episode. And anyway, but now that I've finished it, it's like, oh, at least it's like, it's done now. Well, I kind of want another season. But anyway, now I can maybe do other things with my time. Um, also, quick update. Um, so I got an email yesterday. I'm sure this comes as no surprise to you, but the board, the district board officially, um, officially voted on uh, credit, no credit for um, for the rest of the semester. So yeah, just letting you know that that was the official decision. Not that that's really any surprise to you. Okay, so um, for today's lecture, we're finishing chapter uh, 54 about ecosystems. So today we're talking about uh, biogeochemical cycles. So understanding how nutrients flow in an ecosystem should be pretty quick, she said, hopefully, because um, it's not like that much information. Okay, so uh, this is kind of where we left off because the slide before this was this one. Um, so this is kind of like a basic framework of biogeochemical cycles. Um, you know, biogeochemical cycles are, you know, talking about how nutrients are going to be um, traveling from abiotic reservoirs. Abiotic is your non-living factors in an ecosystem. And so nutrients are going to travel from abiotic reservoirs to biotic reservoirs. So I'm going to start kind of um, towards the bottom of the picture where it says abiotic reservoir. And you can see that there's a circle that kind of links it to geological processes. And that's just representing that, um, you know, nutrients that can travel like within abiotic reservoirs such as air, um, rock, water, um, just through like processes such as weathering or um, sedimentation or something like that. Like weathering would be how um, nutrients in rock get to the water or something like that. And um, so at this point, the nutrients have not entered the biotic uh, reservoirs yet. But when nutrients are available, um, you know, in the water or the ground or the air, um, it's available to producers, plants, uh, or you know, anything that that uh, uses photosynthesis to um, to kind of like make its own food. So then, this is where um, the the nutrients are going to transfer from abiotic reservoir into the biotic reservoir. So now your nutrients are in your on your producers. Um, so I'm now kind of like t moving towards the top of the picture, the green box. So the nutrients in the producers, they're, um, they get transferred to the consumers when the consumers eat the producers. And then you can see that decomposers, they're going to connect the cycle by breaking down um, the, plant, the dead plants and animals. And then they're going to return the nutrients that are stored inside those plants and animals they're either going to make those nutrients available again to the producers or going to just, you know, deposit those nutrients back into the abiotic reservoir and then this thing can continue cycling. So the four uh, cycles we're going to talk about are water, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Okay, so we're going to start with a water cycle. Um, I think this is the most straightforward cycle just because you can actually see the water cycle or you can see elements of the water cycle happening. So we're going to start with um, the ocean or the sea, which is kind of like the bottom uh, left corner. Um, so the sun is really going to power, uh, power the whole hydraulic cycle because when you know energy from the sun reaches the water in the ocean that causes evaporation and so then the water in the ocean is going to go from liquid form into gas form and it's going to evaporate up so you see like the giant blue arrow 
going up from the sea. Um, it says evaporation. And then when it evaporates, as it, um, you know, as the air rises, uh, remember when we, what, like what two lectures ago we were talking about um, air circulation. So when the wet air rises, it cools, and then it's gonna the water is gonna condense from gas form back into liquid form, and then it, it can rain. It can either rain over the ocean, and so then it's kind of like a really closed cycle of it. You know, it went straight from the sea to the air back to the sea. Or the cloud can be moved over to, over the land by wind, and then it rains over the land. If it rains over the land, then you know you get water in the soil, um, water for the plants so that the the plants can grow. And then um, there are two options. So once the once it rains over the land, um, you know when when um, when plants take in water, they uh, basically can sweat <laughs> and that's called evapotranspiration when water is evaporating from the leaves of plants and so that evapotranspiration is going to send the water back up to the air and it can you know form a cloud and then rain again um, or the water that you know goes over soil and isn't um, isn't taken up by plants it can kind of run literally run along the soil or run along the ground and make its way back to the ocean or it can run under underground as like groundwater but either way it, it slowly makes its way back to the ocean and then the whole thing cycles again um okay so that was water cycle carbon cycle carbon um i'm sure you know how important carbon is um it's like the framework of every organic molecule that and that is like making up our body um so for carbon, we're gonna start in the very top uh, where it says CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and we can't use, like we as humans, we cannot use the carbon from carbon dioxide. Like that's not how we can get our carbon. So what has to happen first is um, plants or other uh, photosynthetic organisms, they have to absorb the carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and so it goes in, you know, this this tree here on the right, the, the tree is going to absorb the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then, um, you know, we eventually are going to eat the plant directly or indirectly. And then that's how we're going, you know, the, the plant turns the carbon from the carbon dioxide into um, you know, glucose or a sugar, uh, which is how we are going to absorb those carbons. So consumers, we cons we uh, get the carbon through the plant, and then you know we through cellular respiration we breathe out carbon di uh, we're, we're we're breathing out carbon dioxide, and so we send carbon back into the atmosphere. Um, but additionally, when some carbon gets stored like in our bodies. Um, and the plant's body, and when we die, and the plant dies, when anything dies, um, we're gonna decompose through the decomposers. And those decomposers, um, as they break down, you know, the once alive bodies, um, that will release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere as well. So that's how carbon fully gets back into the atmosphere. And this kind of makes, you know, a nice little circle cycle, but there's this additional source of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's kind of not connected to the rest of the cycle, and that is um, off to the left of the picture here where it says burning of wood and fossil fuels. So that would be combustion. Um, and, you know, combustion is kind of this extra source of carbon in the atmosphere, which is actually negatively impacting the um, the earth because then you you know it's not connected to to the rest of the cycle so it um, it just is kind of like this extra you know source of feeding carbon into the atmosphere and that's can cause carbon dioxide to um, start accumulating in the atmosphere which which is not good for um, you know the climate and everything so okay that's the carbon cycle um, Next is nitrogen. The last two nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, they're a little less, um, I don't know, a little more like you don't really notice it 
because a lot of it is happening, um, you know, unseen to the eye. Um, nitrogen is really important for us because uh, we nitrogen is is critical to our proteins, um, to making amino acids, and so that's why we need nitrogen because without proteins, we're not we are in trouble. So see where should I start with this um, okay night I'm gonna start in the atmosphere again because um, nitrogen so I'm at the top of the picture nitrogen um, is the most um, what do you call it most abundant element in the air in the atmosphere um, and it's in the form n2 because nitrogen is a diatomic element diatomic atom so it, it exists naturally as two of the nitrogens together um, but we cannot we as humans we can't just take in N2 from the air and then you know use that nitrogen to turn it into proteins and neither can plants by the way plants can only accept nitrogen in the form of ammonium which is NH4 plus or a nitrate which is NO3 minus so we need help from these very tiny underappreciated organisms called uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria so I'm kind of moving I'm following the nitrogen in atmosphere box I'm going to the left so I'm kind of working in a clockwise direction so you have some nitrogen fixing bacteria that is kind of attached to um, roots um, particularly in a, a group of plants called legumes so that's why um, Legumes, which would be like your green beans or edamame, um, they're they're vegetables that are considered like pretty like rich in, in protein, just because like they have when they were growing, they had these nitrogen fixing bacteria attached to the roots that was fixing nitrogen and helping the plant absorb more nitrogen, so that they can pass that nitrogen onto us or whoever eats the plant. Um, yeah, so you know, fun fact: edamame is a really good source of protein. Um, a really good source of protein that isn't like you know your typical meat or something um, and it's really good I love edamame good snack okay uh, aside from that sometimes um, you know you don't always have nitrogen fixing bacteria attached to the roots you have it in the soil as well and so um, ammonification is the process of the nitrogen fixing bacteria take uh, you know turning the nitrogen N2 into ammonium so NH4, which is a form that is um, able to be taken up by the plants. But then you can have uh, other bacteria called nitrifying bacteria that can turn the ammonium into, um, into nitrates. So I've kind of moved from the bottom of the picture now to like the right side of the picture. So I'm at nitrates. Um, nitrates, you know, plants can take up either ammonium or nitrates. So the nitrates are going to be assimilated by plants, and um, you know after the plants take up the take up the nitrogen in the form of nitrates or ammonium, then we can eat the plants, and then we can absorb nitrogen that way. And um, you know when we decompose, the decomposers are going to return the nitrogen back into the soil, and then you know the cycle can continue. Um, the way that nitrogen gets back into the atmosphere is you have these a third type of important bacteria um, called denitrifying bacteria, and when they when there isn't oxygen available to them, they can use uh, nitrates to, for their own metabolism, and that's how they'll receive oxygen. But in the process, they uh, in that process they release N2 nitrogen like back into the atmosphere. So then the cycle is fully, um, fully closed. Um, and nitrogen is, is often a limiting factor um, in, the, in the soil for, or in the environment for plants. And so that's why a lot of your, fer if you eat like garden or anything and you use fertilizer, a lot of fertilizer tends to uh, be some combination of nitrogen and phosphorus, which we're gonna uh, talk about in the next cycle. So nitrogen and phosphorus tend to be kind of your limiting nutrients for plants. I mean, carbon is pretty plentiful, um, water tends to be, I mean, you know, there are some areas that are like in drought, but water is usually um, not that much of an issue in an area that normally receives water. Um, okay, so that was nitrogen. 
super important. And now phosphorus. Sorry, this picture is a little small. I didn't realize that before I started this. Um, phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is another um, another element, another nutrient that's really important to us. Why? Because phosphorus is important in making up our um, nucleic acids, which makes up your DNA. So without phosphorus, your DNA would not be survive. You wouldn't have your DNA, and, and you definitely wouldn't be able to replicate uh, DNA. Um, phosphorus is also a really crucial uh, component of ATP, which is basically the energy uh, currency for your body. So phosphorus is really important. Um, plants, um, they need phosphorus too, but they, um, they only accept a certain form of phosphorus called phosphate. So we're going to start with the, the, little, the mountains in the background of this picture. So phosphate might be trapped in like rocks, let's say. So they're right currently in an abiotic reservoir. And then as the rocks weather, which is kind of like, um, they're kind of be being broken down, um, phosphate can get into the soil. Um, it's also possible as, as, the uh, as the rocks are weathering that phosphate can get into the water and then it can run off into the ocean or stream or whatever body of water is near it. So that's how phosphate would get to um, your, uh, your water biomes. But if it's in the foil, so we're, we're going to stick with the light yellow, light yellow area for now. Phosphate in the soil, it, then it becomes available to plants. So then plants can use the phosphate in the soil and then, you know, animals are going to eat the plants. That's how we get the phosphate. We'll eventually decompose, we'll eventually die. And then the decomposers are going to bring the phosphate back into the soil. So that's fine. Um, if the phosphate, you know, runs in along the water or something and gets into the nearest body of water, then that's how you get, um, you know, phosphate is available to, uh, you know, water biomes or marine biomes. And then eventually um, you can get sedimentation when, um, you know, think when uh, organisms kind of die and then like they're dead, dead organisms are going to sink to the bottom of the um, the floor of the body of water, so the ocean floor or the lake floor or whatever, and then you can get sedimentation. And then through the process of geologic uplifting, it becomes new rocks to bring us all the way back to where we started with the mountains in the background. So then you have new rocks with phosphate in it, those rocks will weather, and then this process starts all over again. And then like I said with, um, with you know, fertilizer, uh, fertilizer tends to uh, have some combination of nitrogen and phosphorus to feed the plants just because those are often the most uh, limiting limiting nutrients. Um, okay, and it's important to understand how um, you know how these cycles work so that you can so that you know re you and researchers have an idea of you know how ecosystems function, how do nutrients um, you know how do nutrients move from from place to place inside an ecosystem. So the last thing we're going to talk about is this experiment that was done um, in this forest in New Hampshire that had a bunch of valleys and each valley had a, um, a, uh, a stream that kind of all the streams of the valley were eventually going to uh, converge together in this like creek or something at the bottom. And these, these ecologists, they were doing an experiment to kind of understand how uh, nutrients are um, cycling inside this forest ecosystem. So what they did is they first wanted to measure, they first had to be keeping track of like, you know, nutrients coming in, nutrients coming out. So they would, you know, they would collect rainwater and then measure the nutrients in the rainwater. And then in this top picture, picture A, they kind of created these dams at the bottom of the streams of each valley so that they could collect the water that was coming out and then they could measure the nutrients in that water. And so what they saw was, was you know, for the most part, there wasn't that much of a change. There wasn't much of a net loss or, or net gain of, of nutrients. So then for their experiment, if you can see in picture B, they 
cut all the trees down for in one valley. They basically deforested a valley and they sprayed herbicide over the ground for three years to make sure there was definitely no plants growing in this one valley. And then they did the same measurements of, you know, measuring the nutrients coming in, measuring the nutrients coming out. And then what you can see from the graph in uh, picture C is that in the valley that was deforested, there was a lot of runoff of both water and nutrients. So the nitrate concentration is what's being measured here. So nitrogen runoff into the into the creek at the bottom, it like increased by 60 fold, like 60 times increase. And so this the ecosystem or of that like deforested valley was basically losing um, like losing a lot of its nutrients and especially losing nitrate or nitrogen and um, and this like studies like this it's important because it kind of uh, it, it informs how um, our human actions could potentially um, impact you know ecosystems we might not have like before this experiment, we may not have known that, you know, plants and vegetation, they regulate nutrient cycling so so strongly. And we might not have understood the full impact of like, you know, cutting down trees or, or deforestation. But um, these kinds of studies help to point out like how important trees and vegetation are to their ecosystems and why, you know, cutting down trees for any has to be like taken very seriously and really needs to be um, done carefully so that's kind of like how these kinds of studies and understanding nutrient cycling kind of inter intersects with um, our own actions and our own impact um, okay so that was it for uh, that's that was nutrient cycling um, that's chapter 54 so I hope you have a good weekend um, I don't know try to do something that is, uh, you know, kind of creative or, or something that just isn't involving like a screen. So maybe like cook something or, I don't know, walk outside but with a mask on. Um, or, I don't know, try to draw a picture or something like that. And I'm, I'm saying that for myself as much as, as much as you because I need to be doing more of that too. Um, yeah, so. That's all for that's all for today. I will have a I'll do another video Monday. Um, next week we'll be finishing up eco, uh, ecology, and then I'll see you on Tuesday for our Zoom. Okay, bye.